Welcome, welcome. This is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. Our guests today are the dynamic duo, Nicole Mabry and Steph Mullen, who are the authors of a new thriller, When She Disappeared. Welcome, ladies. So excited to have you here with us. Yes, thanks for having us. (laughs) Let's just dive in. We were chatting a little bit before we got on. I loved your book so much. Thank you. As it was very intricately pieced in such a way that like you just are turning the pages thinking you kind of know what's going on, but not ever 100% being completely sure, which I loved that so much. Yeah. Nicole, can you share with our viewers and readers what When She Disappeared is all about. <laughs> sure. Um, so When She Disappeared is starts with the story of Jesse Germain, who um, went missing a few weeks before high school graduation. And she was the, the town's it girl. She was dating the most popular guy in town. Everybody loved her. She was a cheerleader. And then she goes missing and, and is never found. And her friend, Margot had moved away from this little small town of Lake Moss um, to kind of get away from bad memories and other things that happened to the town. And she doesn't come back until 15 years later when her dad has a knee surgery and she needs to um, help him recuperate. And on the day she returns, Jesse's body is found in a local swimming hole. Um, <clears throat> So very climactic return for Margot. Um, <laughs> um, so a documentary film crew, it's kind of like um, Unsolved Mysteries, a show like that, um, who had originally done Jesse's case, you know, 15 years ago when it happened, um, is doing a, a reboot and comes back to solve Jesse's case once and for all on film. And so Margot teams up with them to investigate whatever happened to Jesse Germain. I love that you brought in Unsolved Mysteries because really when I was reading, I could hear, you know, the theme song that's almost <laughs> before the case. Yeah, you can hear that. So yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, definitely what we had in mind when we were kind of conceptualizing it because mm-hmm. the Unsolved Mysteries reboot had recently come out when we were plotting this and we loved it so much. And we were like watching that and watching a lot of other like true crime documentaries and things like that. So we're like, this is such a smart device to kind of weave in here because it's interesting to us and we feel like it's also an interesting way to get plot discovered so we had a lot of fun writing that part Mm -hmm. and also for me i work in television so and i don't work on oxygen but it's one of our sister networks and so obviously oxygen has all that true crime you know good stuff that we love to watch (laughs) Um, so i watch a fair amount of that as well and i get to see the behind the scenes sometimes so it was really fun to write that part of the book I'm sure you see all sorts of things, Nicole. <laughs> Sometimes. I mean, I probably have the most boring job at NBC. Like, I'm literally sitting at my desk the whole time. Whereas, you know, my coworkers, they're all going off and going to shoots and meetings and everything. And I'm just sitting back at my desk, you know, fielding questions. So, but it's fun. Yeah. You're writing the questions on your notebooks of what are they going to go see? I'm going to yeah. ask them later. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. So Steph, I love that you both are a duo team of mm-hmm. co-authoring, co-writers. How does that work for your process to be able, not only as one author, to try to be piecing together such an intricate thriller, yeah. but to have both of you come together as a team to just amplify it even more. Yeah, we, I mean, we love it. People are always mind blown that we are able to work together and be friends and business we are partners. Too. <laughs> yeah, we are too, it blows our mind all the time. But um, people are always like, how do you do it? Like writing is such a personal solo sport and it's not, so, mm-hmm. it's very, you know, you put so much like sweat, blood and tears into these words you're writing and you take such like personal ownership of it. Um, but Nicole's brain feels like such an extension of mine at this point, like we're yeah. very different we have a lot in common, but we're very different writers. Um, And so when we came together, we're like, well, how do we blend? So it only sounds like one person's writing and how do we make this easier on ourselves? Because at the end of the day, like it is kind of easier writing with a partner. You have half the word count to write. You're kind of editing as you go because we're with a first draft more like a second draft because we're editing each other's words as we write. Um, Mm -hmm. So it really is nice to share that with somebody, but 
our kind of key to success is a really detailed outline. Um, Nicole was a pantser before she started writing with me. So I had to like reel her <laughs> over to the dark side of outlining. Picking and um, screaming. And screaming, yes. And, um, but it just, it's so cr critical for us to make sure everything makes sense because we live in different states now and we have to write independently, but stay on deadline and make sure everything makes sense when we weave it all together. So the first thing we do is we sit down and make an extremely detailed outline, like pretty much every single thing that happens in every single chapter, at least like start middle end and as many details as we can come up with together on the spot. Um, and then we kind of go through and claim whatever chapters are really speaking to us um, because we do have different strengths. Like I love characters and setting. Nicole loves that like plot action kind of side of things. So we kind of always naturally gravitate towards certain chapters. Um, there's usually a handful left that maybe we're both a little hesitant on or not picturing fully. So then we just kind of divvy those up until we have an equal count to work on. Um, but yeah, then we just, we work at our own pace. We set deadlines for ourselves. Like, hey, let's have the first half of our chapters done by the end of next month or whatever it may be. And we just trust each other. So we each write our chapters, we upload them to a Dropbox. We edit each other's chapters and we then we just string them all together. And the outline kind of helps keep that cohesive thread um, throughout everything. So, you know, where my chapter left off, it makes sense when her chapter starts after it. Um, and yeah, and we just, we take turns editing. We use a lot of like track changes and in margin comments and all that kind of fun stuff. So we can talk back and forth as we write and edit and get on a lot of these kind of video calls to chat through things. So we're just really open with each other and, and trust each other's strengths. And so far it's been working really well, so. I'm actually kind of shocked that we've never fought over a chapter yet. Not yet. I, it may be one day. <laughs> no, I want to write that one. No, I want to write that one. That's never happened because no, like, no. we have such different things that we like to write within a story. So mm -hmm. it works really well. And just to go off of what Steph was saying, I'm I, is still kind of shocked that, you know, Steph lived in New York City and that's mm -hmm. how we met. And we were both writing at the time and we would we would call each other and be like, hey, let's write today. And we just go to a cafe and we'd sit across from each other and write our own solo projects. Yeah. And it was so great. And then she moved. And so we didn't start writing into together until so she we were long distance. <laughs> yeah. <feet> <laughs> yeah. But it all worked out. We were I mean, then obviously the world shut down and we yeah. were working. We were already kind of set up to work remotely. So nothing really changed in our process. We were already just kind of like doing it, doing it online and video chatting and FaceTiming a million times a day. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's been really nice. I would say it's really nice to have someone to share the highs and lows with. So very grateful. I really love that you guys like your energy just kind of sinks and flows. And I love stuff how you brought in multiple times the value of trust. Yeah, I think that oftentimes that is what is missing in partnerships that you really have to not only lean into your artist, but trust mm -hmm. your partner's artist as mm -hmm. well to be able to create that dynamic you're looking for. So absolutely. Yes. Love <laughs> that. Love that yeah. so much. Yeah, for sure. You and have to trust your partner. Yeah, you have to, because at the end of the day, like we both want what's best for the story and we both want what's best for the business as a whole. And we know like part of the reason we wanted to work together was that we knew we had opposite strengths. Like we kind of would joke, if we could just be one author, how perfect would it be? Like we just be one person. Um, so to us, like we know, like if the other person is bringing their expertise to the table, like we just trust like you're the expert in that area. And so you you want what's best for the book, too. Yeah. And we just lean into that. And it's it's been really great so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I love it too, because the voice throughout your story is very like sometimes in different partnerships, if you're not in line, in alignment, yeah. you can kind of sense yeah. that voice change and mm -hmm. that disorientation within a novel. And yeah. it is so smooth. Thank you. That's our goal. So that makes my heart so happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> you can't tell that there's a difference there because it okay. really is very smooth. I mean, we were very worried about that when we wrote the very first book that we wrote. Um, that was probably our main concern. Like, if we're going to be writing different chapters, how do we make sure it comes across as one voice as opposed to two people writing a book? Um, and so we just winged it. We were like, okay, let's just try the process <laughs> and see if it works. And it ended up working perfectly. Yeah. And, you know, we do a lot of research and prep work. Like we have really detailed character documents, setting documents, brainstorm documents. We really make sure that we both have a really good visual of what everyone looks like, what this place looks like, what the tone of everyone's personalities are. Um, Nicole loves making graphics. So we have like 
timelines and charts with photos of characters and all these kind of wonderful things but just making sure we're on the same page from the get-go because that like you said that was our goal like we didn't want it to sound like multiple voices because we we haven't even neither of our books we've written so far have been in a way where it was just like alternating chapters that we could just do you write this point of view and i'll write this point of view like it's just not how it's panned out at this stage so we had to find a way to make sure you couldn't tell and that the characters voices were staying you know cohesive and and things like that so We'll, we'll see. So far, it's working for us. So hopefully, it continues to work for us. All that stuff, I think that one day we should try writing a book like that. I know. It would be weird almost. Yeah. Yeah, we should, we should <laughs> maybe one day. We have a lot of ideas like brainstorming. So maybe one of them will, will work that direction. <laughs> like a choose your own adventure, you know, just kind of see where it goes right. back and forth. And exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna be really well, fun. And it's really funny too because. We were really worried about that cohesive voice as well because we both gravitate towards different point of views when writing. Like I love kind of a third person writing style and Nicole loves first person. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, that's always like our first debate is like, well, which point of view is this gonna be written from? And on the first book, The Family Tree, we actually wrote the first three chapters both ways and then let beta readers vote on which one sounded better. We literally just couldn't decide. And we we're like, we have to be diplomatic about this. And I didn't want like any hard feelings yeah you know, on either end, because yeah. we're, we're, I mean, it, it's almost as bad as like, we're very staunch in our views of first and third. Yeah. It's not something we take lightly. Yes, it's, it's a very important. passionate conversation. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Democratic and Republican. She's like first person, third person. I'm like, I'm not coming over. Uh, <laughs> so that's why we were like, let's do a vote. That way you won't be mad. I won't be mad. Whoever says, you know, whatever they say sounds best. That's what we'll go with. Um, well, once this appeared, it was easier because I think we knew right away with the plot that it, it had to be from the point of view it was from in order to not give away what we didn't want given away at certain times and places with different people's perspectives. So I think that one really spoke to us that we needed to write it the way we wrote it. But the first one was a little trickier. <laughs> and I do think that we're getting better as we write each book, knowing instinctively from the plot that we've come up with which voice it needs to yeah. be told in. So and we've learned a lot as we've gone. Yeah. Through. So I don't even know that we need to do that again. Yeah. Like we'll have a conversation at the beginning and we'll talk about it for about 10 minutes and all of a sudden we'll just be like, nah, it needs to be third or not. <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it, it's it's gotten much it's easier. Yeah. It's improved. <laughs> it organically takes its yeah. own voice over yes. time. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Nicole, so your main character, Margot, one of her ways to release pent up aggression is playing baseball. Mm -hmm. What is something that you personally do to release pent up aggression for yourself? Um, so one of my favorite things to do is it in the middle of quarantine, because, you know, everyone was getting very anxious and you had all this energy <laughs> you had to get, especially in New York City. We don't have yeah. a lot of green spaces that we can go hang out and like, be apart from other people while doing so. So, you know, especially right in the beginning, I felt very trapped in my apartment. Um, so I ordered um, a trampoline. <laughs> I put that in front of my TV and whenever I have like extra energy just to get out or, <laughs> or anything, I'll just, I'll put on a horror movie. <laughs> I That's for escape. It. It's fine. Yeah, it's, it's fine. my safe space as horror movies, which is the craziest thing to say, but it's true. Um, and I'll just sit there and bounce until like whatever needs to get out is out. Um, I love it. It's great. I recommend everybody get a trampoline for your for your home. Well, and rebounding is very good for you. It's supposed to be great for like lymphatic drainage and things. So it's like a very good workout. So you're on top of it. <laughs> I'm visualizing that, Nicole, because you got the <laughs> horror films, right? So you got that adrenaline and that pickup. Yeah. So emotions are flowing and then that energy. And so like the whole thing. Nicole's very it's tiny cool. too. So it's like an even better visual. She's very tiny. Say. I feel like I should like start a an exercise workout. Like, yes. okay, we're gonna watch this horror movie and we're gonna bounce for the entire time. And when you things should. pick up, you gotta run on it and like <laughs> That would be fantastic. I think you should do that. New, biz new business venture. I will sign up like <laughs> yesterday. That sounds like exactly my kind of thing that I'm needing. I love that. <laughs> a personal horror recommendation for every like class or something. It's a fitness book club kind yeah, of. Kind of. Yeah. 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 <laughs> love it. What about you, Steph? Was there something that helps you release pent up emotions and feelings? 
Um, I would probably say I'm lucky now in the sense that since I don't live in New York, I have a lot more kind of outdoor space now that we especially own a home and a really nice tree lined neighborhood. And I have a very sweet rescue pup who is like my shadow and she loves her walk. So, um, she's, she's like my savior because anytime I'm like glued to my computer or I'm stressed out or I'm stuck, she's always like, mom, time for a walk. And I get to go on a really nice leisurely walk with her and kind of snuggle her on the couch after. And I mean, it's just so comforting because she was just there all the time. So that's been such a blessing to have her come into our lives. Um, and then on the flip side of that, kind of in line with Nicole's horror movie thing, my husband and I are very into movies. We've actually, like when we started dating 11 years ago and whatever it was now in college, um, we started watching a lot of movies together and we're like jokingly like, let's just like keep a list and write them all down. And so we still have the original list and we've been adding to it for the entire like decade plus we've been together. So we have like a binder that's every movie we've like ever watched together over the years. So that's always like kind of our go-to thing when we just want to relax and like, you know, decompress. We're just like, what, what movie are we watching today? And so we keep adding to that, which has been really fun. And what I well, love about that is that they know I love horror movies and you know, it's not often that they're in the mood for a horror movie. <laughs> But we're more when, like thrillers. We're more like the thriller, psychological suspense, action kind yeah. of side of things. But Nicole challenges us sometimes. I'm like, kill everyone, gore everywhere, <laughs> kill people in new ways. That makes me happy. That's um, what, like came down her recommendation sometimes. I'm like, we yeah. don't, I was like, we're not in a gore mood, but like we could go a little scarier. So she'll, so she'll text me and she'll be like, okay, Danny and I are in the mood for really good horror movie. Do you have something a little tamer? And I'm like, yeah, so she goes through her list. Sure. <laughs> My husband and I have been together for like 17 years and we're huge movie buffs as well. Oh, he nice. loves horror yeah. and I love oh, thrillers. Yeah. So if we can get a blend of like a yeah. horror thriller, psychological thriller yes. together. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Overlap a lot. They do overlap a lot. Yeah. It's just a matter yeah. sometimes for me about like how much gore there is, is what like tips it over sometimes <laughs> too much for me. Um, Cause I'm not into like the violence just for violence, but if it has like a purpose to the story, then I can do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I'm totally with you on that. Don't go to Saw then. Cause that, <laughs> that can get that goes that was gory. We actually went to Saw right after I had a C-section a week oh, after. Gosh. And my, it, that was a horrible, horrible decision <laughs> for everyone. Like, <laughs> whose idea was that? <laughs> was that your husband's idea? <laughs> no, actually my husband was like, I can smell it. Like we have to leave. And I'm like, okay, yep. That's, and yeah. he sits through everything. So I'm like, yeah, we'll like, we gotta go. We'll go. <laughs> it's a rough one for sure. Mm -hmm. What do you love, Steph, most about writing thrillers? Um, I mean, to me, it's just like I've always been so fascinated by psychology and by true crime and by why people do such things that are so unimaginable, but to them, it makes sense. Like they have some sort of reasoning, whether it makes sense to the rest of us or not. Mm -hmm. um, that causes them to act in these ways that are unfathomable to, you know, the everyday person. And so that's always been really interesting to me. Like in college, I studied a lot of like homicide and psychology classes and things like that. I was just like Jen, Jen Ed, I was like, oh, that fits that requirement. I'm going to take that. It just fascinated me. Um, and so I've always enjoyed history and serial killers. That's the class I'm taking. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. Um, and so I've always just been really interested in that just from a purely like, how does this happen? And how do I not become a victim point of view? Because I've always had that anxiety of like, how do I not become a victim yeah. to one of these people? Um, and so taking that you know, interest is really cool to kind of then fictionalize things based on either true events or just things that we've heard or personalities we've studied or heard about um and it's it's just fun to craft something that's so out of your normal world um mm -hmm. but at the same time is believable that it could happen to you that's what makes it kind of scary right like i love that like adrenaline pumping of what's going to happen like is this person going to make it or is this person going to solve that crime so um as a reader i really enjoy that so as a writer it's really fun to kind of create that for other people for their experience mm -hmm. Totally agree. What about you, Nicole? What's your favorite thing? Well, you know, Steph and I are a little bit different in that, you know, when I was a kid and growing up and everything, I wanted to be a photographer. That was my big dream in life. And I spent a good 15, 20 years pursuing that dream. And that's what I do now. I work in the photography department. Um, but I feel like for me, it's all about telling a story, whether I'm telling that story with 
you know, pictures or whether I'm telling that story with words, to me, it's all the same thing. So I just love crafting a story from start to finish. And, you know, also just to touch on what's said about, you know, uh, it being realistic. As women, we know that fear of, you know, walking around in the dark or, you know, not By yourself or, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> And so this might sound a little creepy, but for me, it makes me feel better to have control in the story. Mm -hmm. I know what's happening. I control what the killer does. I control what, what our protagonist does. So for me, that sense of control is a little empowering, you know, mm -hmm. that you don't really get in real life. So that's really great. But I think overall for me, it's just telling the story. I, you know, I, I don't think that I knew that that's what I wanted to do when I was growing up. And I don't know that I thought that that's what I was doing when I was doing photography. But now looking back on all of it, I'm like, that is what I was doing. And now this is just another phase of that. Um, so that's really what I, I love doing, telling a story. And it's great, too, because Steph and I have such opposite strengths in that realm. You know, a plot. I that's what I want to tell. When I'm when I'm writing a book, I want to tell the plot. I want to get into the plot details. I want to make sure everything's landing. Whereas Steph is just like, she wants to build the world of the story and she wants to build the character development and all of that. So for me, it's, it's that, I know she's got that covered. So yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to work on the plot. I'm just going to tell the <laughs> It's, and let me tell you, it's a relief because anytime we're stuck and we have a plot hole, Nicole will go down a research rabbit hole for like days until she's <laughs> happy that she has at least like five solutions that will work for it. Like, so she, it. like she will knock down, like knock on every door, call every person she has ever met in her life that may know something about that topic. Like she is fearless <laughs> in her pursuit of information. So um, it's always really fun to see what she comes up with. And then, yeah, I like to kind of get into the more like nitty gritty details of it, but it's, it's a cool kind of combination of what we like about the genre. Yeah. Do you Steph notice as you're building characters and kind of trying to understand why people behave the way that they mm -hmm. do, does that help your perspective of seeing the world and people differently as you're going through that research? Um, I think a little bit, just because I think when you're developing characters on a blank piece of paper um you kind of think about everyone you've ever met or everyone you've ever seen in the news or read about and you kind of think about their different traits and what made them tick and what why they did certain things or what backgrounds they came from and i think even if it's subconscious like that's how we build our knowledge of people um and so i think by understanding what characters are doing, you maybe you think a little differently when other people do similar actions or you meet people with those similar traits like i think like nobody's perfect like perfect characters don't exist because perfect people don't exist like life is messy and and nobody's 100 percent good or evil and i think getting to play with that dynamic makes you appreciate that in the real world a lot more too like there's just there's always gray area and as writers we get to have fun playing in that gray area but um it does definitely make you think about the people you meet and have a little bit i think more empathy for some people as well that's a great title for a new podcast about books playing in the gray playing in the nailed it <laughs> Look at us with all these new business ideas in this in this chat. I love it. <laughs> you just fire off ideas when you're chatting and everything just starts curating new things. I mean, that's how all of our ideas happen. Like Nicole always jokes the, the way to our good idea is like a hundred bad ideas. And that's like, we just have no shame when we talk. We'll talk for like an hour and the amount of like ridiculous things will bounce back and forth before, before we're like, Oh, wait, here's a good idea that somehow came from that mess is like a huge part of our process. I think that that's actually one thing that I have never, ever had any filter on. I'm not afraid of bad ideas. I will shoot the most absurd ideas out at, at anybody yeah. and they'll, they'll just laugh at me. But Steph's like, OK, but how can we make this into a good idea? And that's <laughs> what makes a good co-author. You know, I have a sliver of an idea and, you know, my horror brain is going, let's do all these amazing things to it. And she's like, no, 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 no. Let's do <laughs> that. There's something there. There's something there. We have to find what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling off the layers on the onion, like, which exactly. part are we really targeting there? It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, going to your question kind of tied to serial killers, do you, is that why you have a fascination? Is there a fear based there or a curiosity about why they tick that fascinates you? I think for Steph, it's a little bit more as to why they tick. For me, it's 
again, it's more of the fear and then being able to control the situation um, that is always motivates me. Um, I grew up in California during the era of serial killers. I grew up during the Golden State Killer, the Night Stalker. So, you know, I grew up, my dad is an avid newspaper reader. So when we would be sitting down eating breakfast, he'd be hollering out all the, the headlines, what's going on. And so, you know, every other day it was like Night, Night Stalker hits again, Golden State Killer hits again. And so growing up as a kid in that, you have this inherent fear that some guy is going to break into your house and kill you for no reason at all. You know, that's that was inbred in me growing up where I did. And I, I think I remember, I think I told Steph about this too, um, the Night Stalker specifically was operating in our area at the time. And there was something in the newspaper at the time that it was like, you know, some statistician or something was like talking about the different houses that he had hit and coming up with like, a profile of what type of house he would hit. And I remember hitting all the points of our household. And I was like, oh my God, we're gonna die. He's hitting us next. Um, so from a young age, I always was the type of kid and still to this day, I still am. When I go to a new place, I always make sure I know where all the exits are. I know how to get out of any room. <laughs> like it's insane. And I think that, I think part of that was turning that fear into a power of mine, you know, like I'm going to turn that fear into, if I go in every place and I know where every exit is and I know what to do, if someone comes in, no one can hurt me. And now I'm like, well, the serial killers in my books can't hurt me. So I can make them do really horrible things. And other people, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happened to me. <laughs> so, yeah. I understand that. And there's a curiosity that kind of bends into that fear too, of like yeah. acknowledging where that comes from as well yeah. and why and embracing all. it. I mean, I can't change my childhood. I can't change what happened. I can't change what formed those feelings inside of me. They are what they are, but to be able to harness it and, you know, output those feelings in a productive way is how I, you know, deal with it. And I love it now. It's like a part of me. I love it. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to the inner child question segment. I love it. Are you ready? <laughs> Let's go. Okay. This is for both of you, but we'll start with step first. Okay. Step, what was on, what songs were on your playlist as a teen? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, it depends really on you got me in because there was some like I had that stereotypical like kind of emo phase where I was like listening to like Green Day and My Chemical Romance and like <laughs> yeah so we had that like black eyeliner phase um and then I feel like I also had that very stereotypical like night because I first of all something to know about me Nicole is we are there's a big age gap. So we come kind of from very different backgrounds. And so my answers playing would be very different from her on this. Yes. Um, but I was very much in the like, in sync Britney Spears, like age of growing up and <laughs> still no shame. Like we've sometimes put nineties on nine on Sirius in the car. And like, I still got every word down and it makes my heart. <laughs> <deep>. <laughs> so definitely like some like darker points and some poppier <laughs> points. Like, it was the whole spectrum for sure. Yeah. yeah, the whole bye bye bye. Exactly. Like, the whole yeah. like, what are down. you doing? Yeah. 100%. Actually, came in very handy on our first book because yeah. we have on our first book we had a serial killer that's killing for forty years. Yeah. And so we have to put we had to put those like cultural references, cultural references into those mm -hmm. chapters that were like would date the chapter to what it was. Mm -hmm. And so obviously, you know, I, I came from an earlier generation from stuff, so I was able to put all my stuff in. And then once it got to her generation, I was like, I'm. Yeah. Stop. Like what happened in these years? <laughs> what was popular at this time? How did yeah. people dress? You know, like that kind of thing. What were your songs on your playlist, Nicole, when you were a teen? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is I wrote a solo book before we started co-writing co together. And I started it very early on on that book to listen to music while I was writing. And so now every time we write a new book or I write a new book, I curate a, a playlist before I start writing just to kind of get me into the mood. Um, so there was a lot of books about, or sorry, a lot of uh, songs about being watched, um, you know, uh, 
from the 80s and the 90s. We have, <laughs> there's that one song and I can't remember what it's called um, or who the artist is, but it's like, I always feel like somebody's watching me. That one was amazing and I played it over and over again. That was really great. Um, I had, you know, a uh, Billie Eilish, bad guy. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, but then, you know, I feel like I really needed to get some female empowerment in there. So I always have a little bit of, you know, like maybe Katy Perry roar in there or, you know, Girl on Fire by Alicia Keys, something in there to kind of like pump me up along the way. Those are two of my favorite girl power songs too. Yeah. Those are good. They're good. <laughs> Like, yes, I am on fire. <laughs> I'm gonna roar, I'm gonna let it loose. <laughs> oh, poor man. <laughs> so we'll start with Nicole on this next question. What detective or investigator did you enjoy growing up, either as a kid or a teen? That was you can't take mine because you know who mine is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take your <laughs> right now. Yes. Um, so I grew up in the era of America's Most Wanted and um, Unsolved Mysteries. Um, stuff is kind of getting Unsolved Mysteries more in the current iteration. But I grew up in, when it was like actually being produced way back in the day. Um, and so I know for he's not an investigator. He's dad. But he was looking for his child. Um, the for the one for um, America's Most Wanted or something like that, he, his son, Adam, had gotten kidnapped and then they found him dead later and then did this big, huge investigation. It was all in California um, and I followed the case. My mom actually, I was like 10 at the time. My mom made me watch the, um, the <laughs> Lifetime-ish movie yeah. about him so that I wouldn't wander off in stores and things like that. Um, so I grew up watching him and he became the host of America's um, Most Wanted, I think it is. And um, I don't know his name, but it was Adam Walsh's dad. Uh, he was great. And then the host of um, Unsolved Mysteries, who is still doing it, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. I love amazing. him. He, he's so great. Um, and I know those aren't like investigators, but to me, as a child who grew up on television, yeah. those were my investigators. And also the really old guy on Dateline with the, the white hair mm -hmm. and he's very thin. I love him so much because when they're shooting an episode that he's hosting, they take such risks on the, the framing of the shots. Like I remember I was watching one and he was driving in his car talking and then so-and-so da, 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 da. And they were shooting in a car behind him through the rear view mirror that he was looking at. I was like, that's amazing. And they don't, they don't do that with anybody else. So I just kind of love him for that. Does the photographer part of you also get like, how in the world? That is a great point of view. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm like, I'm going to use that at some point. <laughs> I love that so much. Steph, and yes, I agree with you on Unsolved Mysteries that they still have the same host. <laughs> oh, it's so amazing. great. Amazing. I mean, good for him, though. <laughs> All right, Steph, you're up. Yes. Okay, no, so I don't really have an investigator from my childhood probably as much because I kind of got into true crime, true crime later in life, probably not till like my college and after years is when I really started. I mean, like I watched the occasional reruns of things like America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries and things on Lifetime or whatever growing up, but I didn't really follow it super seriously, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, but Paul Holes is, I think, so incredible in the true crime world. Um, he obviously was a big part of why the Golden State Killer was eventually captured using DNA. And um, I have his, I was just saying, I have his book because I'm reading it right now that he came out with in April. And I just think he's such an incredible, smart human being. And he's just so dedicated to helping tell victim stories and solving true crime, like cold cases. Even in his retirement, he still tries to work on cold cases and spreading information about victims. So I just think he's so fascinating. And I just think him helping solve the Golden State Killer has changed the entire course of how cases are investigated now. And the amount of cases using that genetic genealogy to solve crimes is just fascinating and what inspired our first book, The Family Tree. So I, I have to shout out to, to Paul Holes for sure. I'm not going to lie. For a second, I was like, I'm just going to say Paul Holes to mess I know. Up. And that's what I was like, you better not because you know how much I love him. I know she loves him. So I was like, if I take him, she's I know. I would have been very upset with you. 
Oh, I love this dynamic where you're so good with your books and then you get together and you're like, I'm debating taking that from her. Right? I know. Every time we get asked for like book recommendations or things, we read a lot of the same books. So yeah. I, like, I want to say this one. So you can't say that one. Like, we, oh, yeah. I mean, that's actually the crazy thing is while our movie watching preferences vary greatly, I'm not... It, it, I don't know why, but reading horror is so much scarier to me than watching horror. So I don't read horror because then I'm not going to be able to sleep at night. So I read thrillers instead, which are more, you know, palatable. I can take it and I'm not going to be, you know, up all night. So we we read a lot of the same books. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's the whole dynamic of holding the book and it being mm -hmm. dark and it, for whatever reason, watching you it. You have to imagine it. Like you have to create right. it in your mind. So it's Put different. your head in that. It's yeah. More real. yeah. Mm -hmm. With yeah. TV, you're like, it's still fiction, but with the book, it feels very visionary, yeah. I think. Yeah. TV yeah. to me is very surface. Like, yes, I want character development and all that stuff, but I, you know, I just because I want to know the motivation behind why they're killing people. I don't really care about what they're wearing or what, you know, the, the house that they grew up in look like. I don't care about that. I just want to get to the plot. Whereas with books, I want all of that. I want to read all of that. I want to get into those characters' heads. So it does become more real to me yeah. when I'm reading. <laughs> Steph, I'm going to have you answer this question first, okay. and then we'll turn it over to Nicole. Okay. What is the oddest food combo that you've liked and tried or you've just tried? Um, okay, this is this is an interesting one because I feel like I don't know if it's odd or not. Like, you know what I mean? Like you you <laughs> can like, here. To you. Um, but I'm a very like salty sweet combo kind of person. Mm -hmm. Um, I that's like my favorite thing ever. And so growing up, I would always dip my French fries in honey. And like as I got older too, I also occasionally have like had honey with pizza, which I feel like might be really weird to people, but it's delightful and you should try it. That is weird. It's really weird. Somebody told me it in a like college once we were at a pizza place and they like dipped their crust in honey and they're like, you have to try it. And then, so every once in a while I bust it out if I have pizza and it's actually pretty delightful. So now I kind of want to try it. Yeah, now I you should try it and report back. <laughs> the spicy and the sweet, like it is odd. Together. I've never done it before, but it's yeah. intriguing nonetheless. I mean, and like, think about it, like you, they sell like hot honey and stuff that has like some spice mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. yeah, it's it's a, it's a good combo. I recommend it. <laughs> All right, I like it. I'm gonna definitely try it. Yeah, and I'll let you know. <laughs> Nicole, what is the oddest food combo you've liked to try? Or just try. Again, I don't know if these are odd. And when I talked to Steph about these, she was like, that's not odd. So I'm like, Nicole I'm talks to about the way she eats things. And I'm like, Nicole, it's not that weird, but she thinks it's weird. <laughs> well, one of my favorite things to do is to get a regular Lay's potato chip, a little piece of cheese, put it on top, and then a pickle. And then I eat that like kind of like his little chip sandwich. <laughs> it's delicious. And the pickle has to be dill pickle. It cannot be like sweet or any of other. Very pickles. specific. <laughs> Very specific dill pickle. If y'all are going to try it, dill pickles. Uh, <laughs> and then one thing that I'm totally obsessed with, and I don't make enough, but I had at a party once. And after that, I made it several times. It. I got there and I was like, this is not going to be good, but it was delicious. It was, they had, um, a, you know, baked debris, which is great. Mm -hmm. And then they had gotten like a, gar a whole garlic clove, mm -hmm. chopped the top off and yeah. roasted it. Yep. So oh, that's so sweet. And like, that, off, so yeah. you can like dip your knife in and spread it onto your, into your cracker. And so I walked in, I was doing it. And the woman was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to show you how to do this. So, is a cracker with a, a spread of apricot jam, mm -hmm. then a spread of garlic, mm -hmm. and then a spread of brie. Yeah. Fruit and brie goes very well together. They're deli like jams and brie is so good. Like it's literally the best thing I've ever had. <laughs> My mouth is watering as right. you're talking about so this. Good. So mm -hmm. if Nicole, let's make it for our book lunch. And oh, do it. Yeah, no, we totally should, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's so delicious. And then the last one, this is the only one that I think people 
think I'm a little weird about. Um, I'm a little, I don't eat spicy things ever, which is crazy because I'm Mexican, but I'm, I'm very sensitive to spicy foods. But my favorite spicy food is buffalo sauce. Like I can eat buffalo sauce on everything. So I make popcorn and I dip it in buffalo sauce. It's delicious. That is, sounds good, actually. It is really good. Is your mouth, you have, is it on fire? <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm a wuss with spice, so I'm a little sweating. Yeah, thinking about it. Yeah. That's so, what I'm saying. I am too. So usually I'll dip like five or six popcorns in there, and then I have to take like a five or six popcorn break. Without and any. Then, yeah, and then I go back just to like, you know, calm it Cleanse down. Cleanse your palate a little from the spice. <laughs> Intermission and yeah. a couple of sauce break. Yep. A little break. I like the potato chip idea too, Nicole. It reminds me a little bit of a Lunchable, but a yes. potato chip. Oh, and I loved too. Lunchables growing up. I mean, if my mm -hmm. mom had made me a Lunchable with chips, pickles, and sliced cheese, I would have been in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it has been so much fun chatting with both of you today. Mm -hmm. yes, Thank you, you so much for being here with us. Before we leave, Nicole, can you share with our listeners and viewers some advice that you can give to them on what living a creatively abundant life means to you? Uh, what it means to me is really just following your passions. I feel like most people don't have either the courage or the motivation to follow what you want to do. And, you know, like I remember when I moved to New York City, my entire family was 100% against it. They didn't understand. They also live in California very close knit small family and they were like why do you want to live there um and my mom was not for it my you know my dad and then after years of living here my mom now is she's just like i i wish i would have encouraged you more because you've gone out and found your passions and i don't think you could have done that if you hadn't moved to the place that you did so i feel like taking risks um really dedicating yourself to what you want to do and not being afraid of it when i wrote my first book i'd never taken a writing class at all i you know i you know I, I went to college i know how to write i know how to write a paper i know grammar i know all that stuff but i started with a story to tell and that's it i had no skills under my belt whatsoever and a friend of mine just said you can be a writer if you want to be just try it if it doesn't work out it, it doesn't work out and then i published my first book and it was amazing and so i feel like having no fear and then oh my god tenacity if you have a dream or a goal or anything that you want to work on whether it's photography or painting or, or writing or anything like that you have to want it enough that that tenacious bone in your body is just vibrating at all times because if it stops it's not your passion anymore um and so i've made this this deal with steph i said i'm gonna do this with you until it's not fun anymore until i'm not motivated to do this with you anymore I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I love writing with stuff. Are you breaking up with me? No. <laughs> no. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, most people, most women especially, you know, they graduate from high school, they go to college, and they dedicate themselves to the life they think they're supposed to live, which is, you know, having kids and getting married and all that stuff. And all that's great. I wanted all that stuff. That's what I thought I was going to have. But I made a promise to myself that I would go out and make myself happy, whatever that entailed. So I think, you know, really letting go of society norms, not caring if people want you to have all these different things and that's not what you want for yourself. Um, and just letting your mind go and dedicating yourself to your craft, whatever it is. I love it so much. Thank you for sharing that with us, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Steph, what would you say how can you live a more creatively yeah. abundant life? I would also, I mean, I agree with everything Nicole just said. I think identifying your passion and what gives you joy and what makes you in, like want to do things, like want to get up every day. I think identifying that and then committing yourself to like, what do I have to do to, to experience that and make that a reality and not giving up is just so important. Like. Nicole, like she said, we come from different places. Like she just discovered writing later in life. I wanted to have a book published since I was in like kindergarten. Like it's been something that's been a dream of mine my entire life. Um, and when I, I went to college, I studied actually more visual like graphic design and photography and things like that in college. But then 
transitioned. I just always loved writing. I also took some creative writing classes and was always writing things on the side. Um, and now I'm a creative director for a digital marketing company. So I do do some like ad copy and design stuff like in my day to day. So I am kind of getting to be creative all day, which is nice, but it can also be exhausting. Like you can burn yourself out even with your passions. So, um, but there's, there's always a way. So, you know, just being like Nicole said, tenacious and having a thick skin and just like creating what you want to create because you want to create it and not worrying about the world or like what the world's going to say or think about it. Like I find a way, like I work a full-time job and so does Nicole, but we find hours in the day to do what we love. So I, whether it's getting up early before work or staying on late or working on the weekends, like sometimes there's no break and it's exhausting and it's easy to get burnt out. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we love it so much that it's worth it. Um, so I think just if you want it, like, even if you don't feel like you have the drive some days, like that's okay. Like you can give yourself grace on the days where you don't have it in you, but just not letting that like get you down to a point where you're not going to get back up and keep doing what you love because the world is hard and it just gets harder every day. And there's so much going on out there that can distract you from what matters to you. So I think just holding on to that passion and the joy that it gives you is just so important to not let that go and, and find a way to keep it in your life. And I think that's actually a really important point, Steph, because, you know, you never know what your passion is going to be. I'm about to turn 50 this year, and I didn't find this secondary passion until I was in my late 30s. Yeah. And that was such a surprise. But you can find a passion by inherently having that motivation for it. You know, like if, if there's something that you just don't give up on, that's your passion because you have the motivation for it. Um, if it's something that you do give up on, that probably wasn't your passion because if it was, you would have kept doing it, you know, and writing takes such passion and such tenacity. It's a hard industry. You, I, I, I assimilate it because I work in television to be an actor. I mean, they face so much rejection on a daily basis. And <laughs> criticism and long so. waits and it's, you're putting things out there for people to literally judge as part of their enjoyment. Like it's, it's That's hard and you're very, very it's very lonely for so many people too, which is why it's great yeah. that Nicole and I have each other. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just think that when you have a passion that if there's a will, there's a way and you yeah. can find a way to incorporate into your life and make your dreams a reality. I mean, Nicole and I got our publishing deal for our two books off of a tweet um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. So literally like there's just so, there's always another window to try to open if it means something to you. So just finding yeah. what that passion is and not letting go of that joy, no matter like what around you tries to hold you back, I think is what mm -hmm. makes you get to keep enjoying that, that thing. You're never too old for your passions. Yeah. You're not. So, yeah. <laughs> there's always time. There's always, yeah, there's always, there's some sort of hours in the day for you to do what you enjoy. You just have to like give yourself the Find space and make room for it and not give it up because yeah. of whatever else is going on around you. And I think that really goes back to self-care. You know, I, I feel like this is a generation where we're all making that a priority. I, you know, I grew up in a generation where that was not a priority. So to now be living in this time where it's very acceptable to put all your focus in making yourself happy, that's fantastic. And I'm learning that as I go. And that's so great. And that's definitely helped live a creative life to the way that I want to live it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where can they find you, Steph and Nicole, if they have any questions for you after the show or to look for your books? Yeah, so we do have a website, mullenandmabry.com. So that will have like social media links and book links and all that good stuff. Um, we're also on social media. So like on Instagram, I'm just like Steph Mullen underscore author. Um, we're on TikTok as Mullen and Mabry. We're trying to get more into those. Um, yeah. Nicole, you want to hit her Instagram as well? You're yeah, just you're know what it is. I think it's Nicole Mabry underscore author as well. Yeah, you're <laughs> like, what am I? <laughs> um, so yeah, so we love to chat with we love to chat with readers. Um, yeah. If someone messages us, we always message back. Like that's really important to us. We're like here to chat because we love books and we love mm -hmm. the writing community. And um, we always try to pay that back as much as we can because we've had so many authors who have done that for us and been there for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, very happy to answer questions and talk to book clubs or talk in DMs on Instagram. Um, so yes, feel free to pop over to any of those things or message us through our website um, is always an option as well. As you can tell, we're very chatty. We are. We're very chatty. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite thing. Me too. So, 
much love to you, Steph and Nicole. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much Lord, for having us. This, this has been Absolutely. fantastic. This book is fantastic. And for future oh, successes and creative endeavors, I'm sending lots of love your way. Thank and you. go check them out, Nicole and Nicole Mabry and Steph Mullen with yes. When She Disappeared. Thank and you. as you guys go about your week as well, remember to look around you. You get to create your own story. Find one positive thing that is working within your life. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you next Monday at 3 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time right here. Have a fantastic day. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>